asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater. What is going on, fellow adventurers, fellow truth seekers, and fellow humans? Today, I just want to talk about a word that was laid on my heart, and I've titled it, Get Into the Scripture, Get Away from the Slander. So what is my motivation behind this? I grew up in a small Texas town, and being in Texas, the Christian Western way of thinking, way of viewing the world just kind of permeates everything that you do. We had moments of silence, moments of prayer in public school. We would pray before all of our sporting events. We would pray as a team. Uh, we would pray with our teachers. And so we didn't even really think twice about it. I didn't go to church growing up. I've always believed in a God or a transcendent spirit that animates us and transcends us, but I never really had a relationship with Jesus until the within the last two years. And the biggest, the biggest thing that has resonated with me and that I've seen as I get more involved in Christian culture and in the church and, and everything that's going on is the emphasis on relationship other than religion. And the people that I talked to, my peers growing up, and I, and I talked to other people, and even my parents, that is such a, a foreign concept that I feel wasn't permeated to a lot of people growing up. What, what a lot of people do remember, because very few people— it, from the research, there's a Pew Research Gallup study. Um, very few people, I think between maybe, kind of depends where you look, between 2 and 20%, I know that's a big gap, but less than 2% of people identify as atheists, which means they don't believe in a transcendent deity of some kind. That's not a lot of people. A lot of people in the ages um, below 40, specifically 30 and under, classify themselves as nuns. So they, they're they spiritual, but they're not religious. They don't necessarily believe in any specific one of the, the different gods. And But they what that shows us is people are hungry. People want a relationship with a transcendent power. They want to have some sort of purpose. They want to have some sort of meaning. And, and that's really the goal for this is just to have a, a constructive conversation. I never want to force my belief system on anybody. At the end of the day, we're all acting on, on faith of some kind. We all put our faith in something at the end of the day, whether you put your faith in a transcendent power or you put your faith in culture or you put your faith in other people or you put your faith in yourself and your ability to rationalize through something, you're putting your faith in something. And, and a, a, a good imagery for this is you don't know who made your car. You don't know who designed the roads. But you have faith in capitalism that nothing bad is going to happen. You have faith that when you go to work, you're going to get compensated. You have faith in civilized society that you're going to be safe in most circumstances and that's what allows you to go to the grocery store without looking over the corner that's what allows you to go to work expecting to get your paycheck on a regular basis you expect that but you don't know that you have a act of faith that your car is not going to blow up that someone on the highway isn't going to get angry because of, of, of some complex interplay. So we all act in, on faith, and we all have faith 
in something. And so the, the question becomes, what do you have faith in and why? And then how does that affect us on a, on a day-to-day basis? And I think that all of us can agree that we're all here just trying our best. We're all here just trying our best to live the best life possible. We might differ in what our definitions of what that is, but I would say that a good reason for life is to maximize human flourishing across people, across time. So the greatest amount of people across the greatest amount of time. And that's what this conversation is really going to be about. And then my own personal experience of having a relationship with God, the father, Jesus Christ, the son and, and the Holy spirit trying to talk to the de churched, the unchurched and those have experienced church hurt because from my own experience, I'm not going to lie. I thought that growing up Christianity, there was this God with a set of rules. And if we didn't follow those rules, we were going to be punished, not just for eternity in some theological, mystical realm, but we would be punished here on earth with shame and with guilt. And so just wrestling with that and coming back to being a follower of Christ, I've realized that 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 completely misses the mark, and that's not even really what what Scripture says. And I know that there's over 45,000 different Christian denominations, so you can get into these deep rabbit holes of what truth actually is, but I think that there's head knowledge. We know physical laws of science, peer-reviewed science. Can we replicate experiments across people across time that is what comes as acceptable truth through a scientific method but then there's there's deeper truth there's experiential truth and there's things that touch us on a on a deep level that we know to be true but our capacity to express it using language is impossible and the greatest example of this is Moments of awe inspired by nature, inspired by beauty, and inspired by art. There's a reason that that art pieces go for hundreds of millions of dollars. So we have this, this monetary value and this emotional value of art, but we can't really verbalize what that value is about the human experience. We just know that it does something deeply rooted inside of us and and some of us through a theological lens might call that the soul rational lens might say it's a complex mix of emulation and neurochemicals in our nervous system that expresses this feeling but our language processors the language part of our brain can't uh, can't explain it but i would argue that it transcends us that that feeling and so we so we we know that there's different types of truth. And so when we go through the the Christian Bible, it's all about relationship and and it, nowhere in there does it say and so let me back up for a second. A lot of my peers fall into the into the nuns group. And what I mean by that is they're not atheists. They do believe in a higher power of some sort and they wrestle with what that is and they don't want to go to church they don't want to do the rituals they don't want to do the sacraments and i'm here to to just kind of go through scripture present scripture because in the new testament in in jesus's teachings of the gospels and apostle paul in the new testament in the new covenant nowhere does it say you're supposed to go to a mega church temple It doesn't say that at all. Nowhere does it say that we're supposed to condemn each other and judge each other. And so one of the the most cited reasons for people falling out of Christianity after becoming an adult is they felt judged. They felt that there was hypocrisy or hypocrites in in the church, a holier than thou, a a more, more moral than thou feeling and sense from people. Uh, there's, they don't understand the strange stories and let's be real. The Bible is really, really weird. 
it's super strange. But but with that said, what's more strange about the strange stories is why have they been around for thousands of years and why have they resonated with billions of people across different cultures? I don't know which one of those facts is more strange, but I, I think that we, our school system raised us in a way to, to think and, and thus perceive the world, and we weren't taught how to think through a philosophical lens. We weren't taught how to think through a theological lens, so it's hard to read these texts and wrestle with the text. Heck, reading is hard enough, let alone these, these strange stories. Um, another reason is all the other different religions and so Christianity, you'll hear this from Christians, we believe that Christianity isn't a religion. We believe it's about a relationship with God, and we'll dive deeper more into that. Why is there so much pain and suffering? How can we have faith in something that we can't see, which we already kind of touched upon? All of the, the strange rituals and sacraments, they're not explained in a way that resonates with people. They're not explained through that Western scientific method lens that we're all taught how to think through that lens. So, of course, it doesn't make sense to us. Um, pride blinds us from a lot of things. Experiences of we've tried other things, and that has resonated more with our soul. And, and I know that I've done that. I've gone down. I've, again, I've always believed in God, but I always haven't always had a relationship with Christ. Um, but even when I went down the Buddhist path or I went down the path of stoicism or studying yoga and, and breath work and, and, and these different philosophies and worldviews, they felt good. And I had positive experiences with them so I and I so I understand that it's like hey I, I I tested this out I tested out this Christianity thing it wasn't for me but I tested out this Buddhism I tested out this breath work and I'm starting to feel a lot better and so I understand that that's a really good that's a really good reason to do something right um so over the course of these different YouTube episodes I'm hoping to just have again constructive conversations. I'm a truth seeker just like everybody else. And at the end of the day, you have to, if you keep asking why, eventually you have to take a leap of faith. You, If you ask why enough times, eventually there's a, I don't know. However, using the capacities of my brain and my ability to rationalize, I do take that final leap of, of faith hopefully through a rational lens, to be honest with you. And I think that you can do that with Christianity. And so, but today, like I said, I really want to just focus on this, the, the felt judged aspect for the de church, the unchurched, and the church. Are, and why is that? So as I've read scripture and as I've gotten um, more involved in church, I'm actually in pastoral school right now. And when I'm out and about, I wear a lot of Jesus loves you kind of apparel and stuff. And the feedback has been has been overwhelmingly positive. A lot of Christians are like, oh, we get made fun of, we get persecuted, which is really, really, really naive and really immature because in the New Testament, as soon as um, Jesus gets baptized, he's literally tempted by Satan and then persecuted and beaten and spit on. And so are all of the apostles. Apostle Paul literally was a high-ranking, rich Jewish um, Jewish clerk. Or, or He was just high up in the Jewish religion and rich, right? And he gave it all up to be beaten, to be spit on, to be thrown into prison, and eventually his head was cut off. All for this idea of what the Gospels represent. And so a couple mean comments or, or having tough conversations where people push back on your line of thinking, it's not persecution. It's, it's just called being a mature adult and having mature conversations. And you should be thanking um, the person questioning because we're, we're told 
in the Bible to capture all the thoughts and to get into our word and to discern the thoughts and discern the thoughts of others through the lens of Scripture. So if you're not armed with Scripture, that's your own fault at the end of the day. Um and that might make you feel judged, which is exactly the opposite of the goal that I'm trying to do. But I am talking to the de church, the unchurched, and the church hurt. Uh, I'll have different messages for those that are already involved um, in church. Anyways, so let's go ahead and 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 dive in. And I'm going to use scripture as much as possible. Right, I am human. And so don't take everything I say as truth. Again, this is about a relationship. And so you do your own research. You read the different versions of the Bible. I use an ESV study Bible. Um, get with other followers. Get with non-followers. Get with people from different viewpoints. And never stop asking questions. Never stop applying what you read and what you learn to your life and slowing down and being aware. That's what this is about at the end of the day. And it's, and it's your experience and everything. And so I do, I do apologize if I did make anyone feel judged about uh, not reading the scripture. Cause that's not, again, not what this is about at the, uh, at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, what are we going to do today? So first I wanted to go ahead and start off with just saying, what are we called to do as Christians in the New Testament? What are we called to do? Well, first off, we're not called to judge. And so just like I was doing just now, judging people for the scripture, that's a shame on me. We're not called to judge. So from John 8, 7 to 11. And as they continue to ask him, they're referring to Jesus he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And what they're referring to is the Pharisees are, they want to throw a stone at this, um, this prostitute, this adulterer. And Jesus is saying, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Next, we have Matthew 7, 1, 5. And it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so kind of, again, we're not called to judge. This is, there's another, um, another scripture that says vengeance is God's alone, that we're not called to even take vengeance. I believe that, that, that one's in Romans. And so, but it does kind of allude to in this Matthew 7, 1, 5, that once you do dive into the scripture and you're with other followers that are also on this path with you, you can discern and call each other up with love and compassion rather than calling each other out. However, to those that aren't followers, we can't say anything to them. We have no place in scripture to say anything to them. All we have is the following, right? This is what we're called to do. This is the segue into what we as Christians are called to do. So two things. One is first called the great commandments. So what are the great commandments? Jesus in the gospels is asked multiple times by various people out of all the laws, right? All the laws that were given to Moses and the old Israelites, which ones are the most important, Jesus? Which ones are the most important? And he, and he responds in a very intriguing way. 
And so what do we what do we see here? In Matthew 22, 34 to 40, the great commandment. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so let's dissect that just a little bit. In the Old Testament, what is happening is God is revealing his character and revealing his attributes, his holiness and his perfection to us uh, through the law and through the prophets. And the prophets aren't guessing are predicting or saying this is going to happen in the future. They're saying because of this action that goes against God, this is what's going to happen as a result. And so what what Jesus is saying is all of that now with the new covenant can be summarized as love God. And what is love? Love is a relationship. And it's not, and, and we have a definition in scripture for what kind of love we want in Corinthians, which we'll get to later, but we know from personal experience that love is not just a linear relationship. When we love a significant other, or we love our parents, or we love a friend, sometimes we wrestle with that. Sometimes we get in arguments with it. Sometimes we don't feel loved, right? And so it's this complex thing, but we're told to love God with all our mind and all our soul. And that's that's interesting. So we need to love something that transcends us. And so God can be defined another way as your highest aim or your, your highest intention in this life. We all have something that we hold to be of most value. And, by, and one good definition of God is that which we have hold in the highest value. So we should have, we need a relationship with that. That's what we're called to do. And then we're called to love our neighbor as though we love ourselves. So we're called to to love ourselves and so kind of defining what that means, but then also by loving ourselves that pours out from us and we love our neighbors. So that's interesting. And then we see this again repeated in Mark and in Luke and then apostle Paul also uh, we'll repeat it, I believe, in Galatians. But let's go ahead and just read two more from the gospel. So Mark 12, 28, 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Finally, we'll go Luke 10, 25, 28, the parable of the good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, This is Jesus. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So it's pretty clear that that we are commanded to do two things, love God and love our neighbor as though we love ourselves. And so we have to define that eventually. But next we go from the two, the great commandments to the great commission. So love is an act. And so it, it tells us what to do. The great commission tells us how to put it into 
action, right? So the great commandment is, okay, this is what you're told to do. The great commission is, this is how you go about doing it. This is how you know you're doing it well. This is how you know you're fulfilling the game of playing the to, following the two great commandments well. So the great commission from Matthew 28, 16, 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What did he command us? To love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He doesn't say judge doesn't say condemn it doesn't say ridicule it says love everybody every corner of the earth let's move on acts 1 8 so we celebrate in christianity we celebrate the birth of jesus and the date is argued it doesn't matter we celebrate it though we celebrate easter which is jesus's crucifixion and resurrection however we don't celebrate the 40 days that Jesus was back on earth after the resurrection, which kind of is a big disservice in the Christian world because it's kind of a big deal that Jesus didn't just die and rise three days later and then go back to the Father on a cloud. He actually spent 40 days roaming around the earth with the disciples, continuing to teach them, and hundreds of people thousands of people bearing witness to Jesus over those 40 days. So that's that's another time. But in Acts 1.8, these are Jesus' last words on that 40th day before he goes on the cloud back to heaven to the, to the side of the Father. This is what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of of the earth. So what does that mean? Okay. In Matthew, we're told to make disciples of all nations. In Acts, we're saying that the Holy Spirit is going to be given to us and that so that we can witness. And so what does witness mean? What it means is we talk about our own experiences of how Jesus, Jesus' infinite, perfect love, agape love, changed our lives here and now tangibly and for all eternity, which which is a complex thing that we're not going to solve in a YouTube channel. They've been debating it for thousands of years. We're not going to end it here. But that's interesting, right? So we're taught that the witnesses, so who who was I before Jesus and who am I now? Who was I before I held the greatest commandments as my God, the as my relationship with God of, of loving God and loving my neighbor as myself, who was I before that was my highest aim, my highest goal? And who am I now that that is my highest aim, that is my highest goal? That's what it means to witness. It's it's your testimony of, of how your life has changed. And you're supposed to do that with as many people as possible to the ends of the earth. That doesn't sound like I'm supposed to go on a crusade. That doesn't sound like I'm supposed to just go and can try to convert everybody necessarily. All it says is I'm supposed to have a relationship with God. I'm supposed to work on loving myself and giving myself grace and forgiveness and patience and kindness and goodness. And I'm supposed to do the same for my neighbor and then I'm supposed to tell people about my story of who I was before and who I am now, constructively and with compassion. I'm not supposed to say, you're wrong, I'm right. 
I have the truth and you don't. That's not what it says. It says I'm supposed to witness and share my testimony and then let that person decide for themselves if that is something that, that they may want to try to experience on their own is having a relationship with God and having a, uh, loving themselves and loving their neighbor. That's what that, that's how I interpret that. I don't know. Um, so let's keep going though. What I want to say there is, is so we're supposed to carry on trying our best to spread out what Jesus taught the disciples. And I already dove into that. What did he teach? Well, God, and we'll get into this later. God is God. The father is a spirit and we can dissect that later. But Jesus was the manifestation of that spirit. And so if you slow down for a second, kind of think like, how did my how did my personality form and, and what am I trying to do on a day to day basis with my actions? Well, some of that is genetics, but then some of that is we watch other people. We watch their personalities, we watch their actions, we watch their character, and we see kind of how they're the fruit of their life, the positives and negatives, and then we decide. We're constantly emulating each other, posturing, and our personality is evolving based off of that. And so what this is saying is Jesus as the king of kings, if I'm going to emulate somebody which you're constantly emulating other people right when you go have friends or you interact with people socially based on their feedback you're going to adjust your topics of conversation you're going to adjust your actions and behaviors because you want to belong as a social creature and so what this is saying is the highest aim that we should try to emulate is the king of kings, which is Jesus, which was God, the father, the spirit embodied in the flesh. And so what, what did he embody? He embodied love. Scripture says this. It says what God is, and it says what Jesus is. Love, truth, light, and word. And then we're told that the great commandments and the great commission— Right, we don't the we don't just go to heaven when we die. What actually is going on is we are participating. God says, "Hey, once you get baptized, once you choose to be a follower of Christ, you get to participate in eventually earth heaven coming down to earth and earth being heaven and our souls being resurrected in perfect heavenly bodies here on earth earth and so heaven is the perfect love and so if we could do away with anger bitterness envy jealousy hate if we didn't have that anymore vengeance if we didn't have that anymore if we just lived in a perpetual state of perfect love and perfect truth that would be some sort of heaven and we and we kind of grasp that that kind of makes sense and, and it make we're almost moving towards that Right as ethics continue to evolve, as as social contract theories continue to evolve, it seems like we're moving towards a place of acceptance, and freedom, and love and truth, and and that's happening here and now. We get to participate in that, and so this is beautifully captured. I would say the Great Commission is beautifully captured in uh, Galatians five twenty two twenty five that through our actions of loving God loving our neighbor as though we love ourselves, we're increasing what is called the fruit of life or the fruit of the spirit. And so from Galatians 5, 22, 25, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so through our actions of love, we're trying to increase these nine different fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control within ourselves and within others. It seems like a rational, logical aim for a good life, to be honest with you. I would much rather have these experiences of emotions than anger, bitterness, jealousy, hate, envy, etc. And then this is also beautifully summarized uh, by Apostle Paul in Romans 13, 8, 10. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. 
For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. And like I talked about, the what was the law and the prophets? That was revealing God's character and attributes. And, and what Paul is saying is, love does no wrong. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. And if the law is God's attributes, one can deduct that God is love, which it does say that in Scripture. And so lastly, before we, before we move on, Galatians 5.14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Seems pretty clear cut to me that we as Christians are called to do one thing, and that's love. So 